This presentation is going to deal with multiplayer blocks. Multiplayer blocks are probably the most questioned item in captain's meetings and the most inconsistently called amongst referees. This presentation is simply going to outline what is and what is not a multiplayer block. Before we begin, however, I'd like to give you some fair warning. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level 4 referee with the WFTDA, but I am not working for them, and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on refed.com. The bulk of this recording was done on June 17, 2014. A minor update was added on January 3, 2015, regarding the December 2014 rules release. Before I go into the physical process that creates a situation where a multiplayer block can be called, I need to go over this very important prerequisite to the call. Multiplayer blocks must be physically challenged by an opponent, and there must be impact upon the player challenging that block. First, this means there's no such thing as an illegal positional multiplayer block, since the opponent must physically challenge the wall that was created. Secondly, and I cannot emphasize this enough, if their opponent breaks through that block, there is no call to make. The penalty is for preventing an opponent from passing them, not for just creating a barrier. The multiplayer block has to be effective in preventing that opponent from moving on past that block. This is probably the second most common mistake I've seen with referees. And the best advice I can give you is to think before you blow the whistle. Ask yourself if the multiplayer block stop the player from getting through. Conversely, I'd ask you not to go overboard. There is no amount of time that it takes or number of attempts before a potential multiplayer block becomes a real one. Slowing down an opponent of any significance is preventing her from getting through. I just don't want to have calls being made if the opponent gets through the block like there's nothing there, or nearly nothing there. The metric I'm looking for, and this is just myself speaking here, again, not the WFTDA, is did that block slow that opponent more than it would have been had there not been a multiplayer block? If that answer is yes, then give the penalty. If the answer is no, then don't. So now let's go into how a multiplayer block can be formed by those teammates. According to the rules, there are three ways to start a multiplayer block. The first is grasping. Grasping involves the hands and is probably the easiest to picture if not describe. Common items to grasp are portions of your teammate's body, such as the thigh, shoulder, or hands, or their jersey. In order for it to be a grasp, the fingers must be holding onto its target, grasping it. If the fingers aren't grabbing a hold of the target, it's just a hand placed upon the shoulder, the thigh, or whatever else that hand is on. And that body part or jersey won't go with that hand should it get knocked into. Keep in mind that these are all legal in and of itself, even if there is grasping involved, until those grasps are challenged by an opponent and that grasp keeps that opponent from moving past them. The second is linking. Linking is also pretty straightforward and probably the easiest to call should that link get challenged. I'll quote the glossary here. Interlocking two arms via crooked elbows. If you need another example, think of a do -si do from square dancing. The third example is the impenetrable wall. 
When the rules were revised on March 1st, 2014, there was really no change in the meaning from the previous rule set. It was simply a change in language to attempt to help clarify when a multiplayer block penalty should be issued. This included the phrase impenetrable wall in the rule itself and the word impenetrable in the glossary. The glossary is important because it defines the impenetrable wall in part as a wall where the only way an opponent could pass the block is by breaking the bones or joints of those performing the block. Impenetrable walls do not have to involve linking or grasping, and so the adding the portion about a situation such as, to use the glossary's example, arms behind teammates' backs differentiates that as opposed to arms in front of the teammates, where if a skater blew through the block, wouldn't cause automatic injury. In all cases, it's the actual link that needs to be what is challenged in order for a multiplayer block to be called as a penalty. So let's go through a few examples of each type of formation so we can try to put these all together. This is a pretty straightforward example. One of the blockers is grabbing her teammate as an opponent is trying to get through. Note that the fingers have closed in on the shoulder and are not flat. Assuming that an opponent is slowed down or stopped, this is a multiplayer block. Here is the same scenario, but with an open palm, which means that this is not a multiplayer block. This can make seeing multiplayer blocks very tricky because they can involve very small parts of the body moving very, very quickly. And it only applies when the block is challenged. This player could have her hand in a grasp the entire time and then release it just as her opponent comes in for the block, and it would not be a multiplayer block. Something to keep in mind is that not all multiplayer blocks are defensive in nature. In this picture, we have a jammer taking a shirt whip off a teammate, presumably to help her get through the pack. But that link is also being challenged. This meets all the criteria for a multiplayer block. The jammer is grasping her teammate's jersey, it is blocking an opponent from getting through that block, and the block is also being challenged where the grasping is occurring. In this case, the jersey counts as part of that grasp. So in this scenario, the jammer would go to the penalty box for the multiplayer block. The tractor trailer scenario is commonly called incorrectly. In this case, the rear blocker is using her teammate as a pivot and to stabilize herself, but her block is still by her butt, not by the link. This is frequently called as a multiplayer block, but it absolutely positively should not be. In order to have a tractor trailer be a multiplayer block, the challenge by the opponent would have to be where the arms are grasping, which is to the side. Like the tractor trailer example, having your arms linked is only illegal if the link is challenged. In this picture, the challenge is happening at the body, not at the actual link. This is the classic example of an impenetrable wall. In this picture, the skater cannot get between and past the two blockers without causing serious physical damage to them. Even though the blockers are not linking nor grasping, this impenetrable wall is a multiplayer block. By the way, in a scenario when both players are performing the same multiplayer block, the player nearest the referee making the penalty call is the one who actually receives the penalty. If an inside pack ref calling the inside blocker and an outside pack ref calling the outside blocker make a call on the same multiplayer block, both blockers do not serve the penalty. Work it out quick so that only one goes to the penalty box. Don't fight over it. This is a similar pose to the last picture, except that the arms are in front. Because of this, if challenged, the arms could swing open like a saloon door, and therefore it does not qualify as an impenetrable wall. However, should one or both blockers stand up their opponent, it could very well be a forearms or elbows penalty. Keep in mind that the impact spectrum for forearms and elbows calls are very different and not interchangeable. 
a skater blocking with the upper arm, a legal target zone, still has to have that arm bent, lest it be a possible elbows penalty. While a forearm call, should the portion of the arm being used be an illegal blocking zone, now has the same impact spectrum as the multiplayer block. Check out the rules and modules when available for additional clarifications. This is also an impenetrable wall. Even though there is a link and the blocker's opponents cannot physically reach those arms, the only way for that challenging skater to get between and pass those blockers is still to dislocate and or break the arms and shoulder of those blockers, which means it still meets the definition for an impenetrable wall and is a multiplayer block. I'd like to wrap up this presentation with a type of block that causes a lot of confusion to players and referees alike. Lately, it's become a very common tactic to have two blockers in a wall with a third skater in front of that two wall skating backwards and bracing them with her arms forming a triangle. Don't let the uniqueness of this block make you think it's any different from any other block. Instead, judge it by what is doing the blocking and what is being challenged. For this example, I'm going to focus on the third blocker, the one skating backwards and bracing the two wall. Partially because this is what tends to confuse people, and partially because any illegal blocking by the two members of the two wall would be just as illegal whether or not there was a third blocker in front of them or not. First, you need to decide if there is any grasping or if there's an impenetrable wall going on. The grasping portion should be pretty easy. As we described, is the skater bracing her teammate with an open palm or a closed or closing fist? An impenetrable wall would require the bracing skater's arms to be on the side of her teammate instead of the front, where the arm could go nowhere if challenged, except maybe with a crunching noise if it was challenged with enough force. Now, if that skater is grasping or forming an impenetrable wall with her teammates, the only place a multiplayer block could be is where that link is formed, and that link is not in the back of that two wall. Unlike the impenetrable wall scenario from a few minutes ago, a challenging skater can break through the space between the blockers in the back of that two wall, and not inevitably cause dislocation, breakage, or other serious injury. The backward skating blocker is helping to reinforce that two wall, making it more difficult to pass, but is in no way making it impossible to break it. The only place you get a multiplayer block is to have a block into the arms or hands of that bracing skater, where those actual links and grasps are taking place. Thank you for watching this presentation. I hope it helps break down the basics of what is and what is not a multiplayer block and helps clear up some confusion and misconceptions you might have. If you have additional questions about multiplayer blocks or any situation you come across, be sure to check out the WFTDA forum, Zebra Huddle, or your local experienced referee. I'd like to thank the following people for help with this presentation. Joe Rollerfan and Dolph Lensgren for the Game Day Pitchers, Betsy Rexy, Chappie, Rita Rockus, and Roly and Lena for help with my posed photos, and the Minnesota Roller Girls for allowing me to photograph in their practice space. If you found this presentation helpful, and I hope you did, please share it. But be sure not to modify it and give the appropriate credit for its presentation. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.